Welcome back to my video series on Scikit-Learn for Machine Learning. In the previous video, we learned about the k-nearest neighbors classification model and the four key steps for model training and prediction in Scikit-Learn. Then, we applied those steps to the IRIS dataset using three different models. In this video, I'll be covering the following. How do I choose which model to use for my supervised learning task? How do I choose the best tuning parameters for that model? And how do I estimate the likely performance of my model on out-of-sample data? Let's start by reviewing where we ended up last time. Our classification task was to predict the species of an unknown iris. We tried using KNN with K equals 1, KNN with K equals 5, and logistic regression, and received three different sets of predictions. Because this is out of sample data, we don't know the true response values, and thus we can't actually say which model made the best predictions. However, we still need to choose between these three models. The goal of supervised learning is always to build a model that generalizes to out-of-sample data, and thus what we really need is a procedure that allows us to estimate how well a given model is likely to perform on out-of-sample data. This is known as a model evaluation procedure. If we can estimate the likely performance of our three models, then we can use that performance estimate to choose between the models. There are many possible model evaluation procedures, but in this video, I'm going to focus on two procedures. The first procedure is widely known, but it doesn't have an official name that I'm aware of, so I'm just going to call it train and test on the entire dataset. The idea is simple. We train our model on the entire dataset, and then we test our model by checking how well it performs on that same data. This appears to solve our original problem, which was that we made some predictions but we couldn't check whether those predictions were correct. By testing our model on a data set for which we do actually know the true response values, we can check how well our model is doing by comparing the predicted response values with the true response values. Let's start by reading in the iris data and then creating our feature matrix X and our response vector y. We'll try logistic regression first. We follow the usual pattern, which is to import the class, instantiate the model, and fit the model with the training data. Then, We'll make our predictions by passing the entire feature matrix X to the predict method of the fitted model and print out those predictions. Let's store those predictions in an object called YPred. As you can see, it made 150 predictions, which is one prediction for each observation. Now, we need a numerical way to evaluate how well our model performed. The most obvious choice would be classification accuracy, which is the proportion of correct predictions. This is known as our evaluation metric. There are many possible evaluation metrics, and we'll learn about other evaluation metrics in future videos. Anyway, Let's compute the classification accuracy for our logistic regression model. I can think of at least three different ways to do this, but I'm going to show you the one way I recommend, which is to use the metrics module from scikit-learn. First, we import the metrics module. Then, 
we use the accuracy score function and pass it the true response values followed by the predicted response values. It returns a value of 0 0.96. That means that it compared the 150 true responses with the corresponding 150 predicted responses and calculated that 96% of our predictions were correct. This is known as our training accuracy because we're testing the model on the same data we used to train the model. We'll now try KNN using the value k equals 5. We import the class, instantiate the model using the argument n neighbors equals 5, fit it with the training data, make predictions on the same data, and calculate our classification accuracy. This time, we get 0 0.967, which is slightly better than logistic regression. Finally, we'll try KNN using the value k equals 1. This time, we get a score of 1.0, meaning 100% accuracy. It performed even better than the other two models, and so we would conclude that KNN with k equals 1 is the best model to use with this data. Or would we draw that conclusion? Think about that for a second. Let's go back for a minute to the previous video in which I talked about how the KNN model actually works. To make a prediction, it looks for the K observations in the training data with the nearest feature values. It tallies the actual response values of those nearest observations. And then whichever response value is most popular is used as the predicted response value for the unknown observation. With that in mind, you could figure out exactly why a KNN model with k equals 1 would always have 100% training accuracy. To make a prediction for any observation in the training set, KNN would search for the one nearest observation in the training set and it would find that exact same observation. In other words, KNN has memorized the training set, and because we're testing on the exact same data, it will always make correct predictions. At this point, you might conclude that training and testing your models on the same data is not a useful procedure for deciding which models to choose, and you would be correct. Remember that our goal here is to estimate how well each model is likely to perform on out-of-sample data, meaning future observations in which we don't know the true response values. If what we try to maximize is training accuracy, then we're rewarding overly complex models that won't necessarily generalize to future cases. In other words, models with a high training accuracy may not actually do well when making predictions on out-of-sample data. Creating an unnecessarily complex model is known as overfitting. Models that overfit have learned the noise in the data rather than the signal. In the case of KNN, a very low value of K creates a high complexity model because it follows the noise in the data. This is a nice diagram that I think explains overfitting quite well. Each point represents an observation, the x and y locations represent its feature values, and the color represents its response class. For a classification problem, you want your model to learn that generally speaking, points over here are red and points over here are blue. 
In other words, you want your model to learn that this black line, also known as the decision boundary, is a good boundary for classifying future observations as red or blue. It doesn't do a perfect job classifying the training observations, but it's likely to do a great job classifying out of sample data. A model that instead learns the green line as the decision boundary is overfitting the data. It does a perfect job classifying the training observations, but it probably won't do as well as the black line when classifying out of sample data. The green line has learned the noise in the data, whereas the black line has learned the signal. Since training and testing on the same data is not an optimal model evaluation procedure, we'll need a better procedure. The procedure I'm now going to show you is called train test split. There are other names for this approach, such as the test set approach or the validation set approach, but please note that those terms sometimes refer to a slightly different procedure from what I'm going to demonstrate in this lesson. Anyway, here's how the procedure works. First, we split the data into two pieces, which we call a training set and a testing set. We train the model on the training set, and then we test the model on the testing set to evaluate how well we did. That's really all there is to it. The key idea here is that because we are evaluating the model on data that was not used to train the model, we're more accurately simulating how well a model is likely to perform on out-of-sample data. Let's go ahead and apply this procedure to our iris data. Before we apply the first step, let's remind ourselves of the shapes of x and y. X is our feature matrix, made up of 150 rows representing the observations and four columns representing the features. Y is our response vector, which simply contains our 150 response values. To split the data into training and testing sets, we're going to use scikit-learn's built-in train-test-split function. We'll import it and then use this somewhat cryptic command to split the x and y objects into two pieces each. It's important to understand what's happening and why, so I've created a diagram to explain the train test split function. For the moment, Forget about the iris data. Pretend that we have a data set with five observations consisting of two features and a response value. The response value is numeric, meaning that this is a regression problem. Our X matrix is five rows by two columns, and our Y vector just has five values. If you ran the train test split function on x and y, it would split x into x train and x test, which I've colored yellow and blue, and it would split y into y train and y test, which I've colored orange and purple. What was the point of this? Well, I now have a feature matrix x train that is size 3 by 2 and a response vector, y train, that is size 3, and I can use those objects to train the model. Then, I can make predictions on x test and compare those predictions to the actual response values in y test in order to calculate what is known as my testing accuracy. Because I'm training and testing the model on different sets of data, the resulting accuracy is a better estimate of how well the model is likely to perform on future data. 
The obvious question is, how does train test split decide which observations and how many observations are assigned to the training set versus the testing set? This optional test size parameter determines the proportion of observations assigned to the testing set. In this case, I've assigned 40% of observations to the testing set, which means that 60% will be assigned to the training set. There's no general rule as to what percentage is best, but people generally use between 20 and 40% of their data for testing. In terms of how the observations are assigned, it's actually a random process. You'll find that if you run this function five different times on the same set of data, it will split the data five different ways. However, if you use an optional parameter called random state and give it an integer value, it will split a given data set the exact same way every single time. I'm going to use random state equals 4. And if you use the same random state at home, your data will be split exactly the same way. Anyway, let's now check the shape of these four objects to confirm that it matches our expectations. The original x of size 150 by 4 has been split into two pieces in which x train is 90 by 4 and x test is 60 by 4. The original y of size 150 has also been split into two pieces in which y train is size 90 and y test is size 60. We're now ready for step two, which is to train our model on the training set. We'll instantiate a logistic regression model and fit it to X train and Y train. Then in step three, we'll make predictions for the observations in the testing set by passing X test to the predict method and store the results in y pred. Because we know the true response values for the testing set, we can compare the predicted values with the actual values stored in y test. We see that this model achieved a testing accuracy of 0.95. Let's repeat steps two and three for our KNN models, again with k equals five and k equals one. For k equals five, we achieve a testing accuracy of 0 0.967. And for k equals one, we achieve a testing accuracy of 0.95. We would therefore conclude that out of these three models, KNN with k equals 5 is likely to be the best model for making predictions on out of sample data. Naturally, you might wonder whether we can find an even better value for k. I've written a for loop to do exactly that, in which I try every value of k from 1 through 25, and then record KNN's testing accuracy in this Python list called scores. I'm then going to use matplotlib, the predominant Python library for scientific plotting, to plot the relationship between the value of x and the testing accuracy.
In general, as the value of k increases, there appears to be a rise in the testing accuracy, and then a fall. This rise and fall is actually quite typical when examining the relationship between model complexity and testing accuracy. As we talked about earlier, training accuracy rises as model complexity increases, and the model complexity for k and n is determined by the value of k. Testing accuracy, on the other hand, penalizes models that are too complex, as well as models that are not complex enough. Therefore, you'll see maximum testing accuracy when the model has the right level of complexity. In this case, we see the highest accuracy from k equals 6 through k equals 17, and we would tentatively conclude that a k value in that range would be better than k equals 5. However, because this data set is so small, and because this is such an easy classification task, it's hard to reliably say whether the behavior we're seeing in this one plot will indeed generalize. Regardless, plotting testing accuracy versus model complexity is a very useful way to tune any parameters that relate to model complexity. Once you've chosen a model and its optimal parameters, and are ready to make predictions on out-of-sample data, it's important that you retrain your model on all of the available training data. Otherwise, you'll be throwing away valuable training data. In this case, we'll choose a value of 11 for k, since that's in the middle of the k range with the highest testing accuracy, and we'll call that our best model. Thus, we instantiate the KNN model with n neighbors equals 11, we fit the model with x and y, and we use the model to make a prediction. As we wrap up, a natural question might be whether there are any downsides to the train test split procedure for model evaluation. It turns out that train test split provides a high variance estimate of out of sample accuracy, meaning that it can change a lot depending upon which observations happen to be in the training set versus the testing set. There's an alternative model evaluation procedure called K fold cross validation that largely overcomes this limitation by repeating the train test split process multiple times in a systematic way and averaging the results. We'll go over that procedure in a future video. Regardless, train test split remains a useful procedure because of its flexibility and speed, and we will continue to use it throughout this series. I've got a number of excellent resources to share with you this week if you want to go deeper into this material. First is a post from Quora that gives an intuitive explanation for overfitting in just a few short paragraphs. Next is a video from Hasty and Tip Shirani, the authors of An Introduction to Statistical Learning, which quickly covers many of the same concepts I went through today. After that is one of my favorite educational articles for data science. It's called Understanding the Bias Variance Trade-Off, and this is the article you should read if you want to really understand why testing accuracy exhibits that upside-down U-shaped curve when you vary model parameters such as K. Not only does it do a great job explaining a difficult concept, but it also has this extremely cool interactive visualization that will help you to better understand k nearest neighbors.
As a bonus, I've also linked to some guiding questions that I give to my data science students that may help to focus your own reading. Finally, if you're still struggling with the bias variance trade-off after reading that article, I've linked to a great video from Caltech's Learning from Data course that may help you to visualize bias and variance. So far in this series, we focused on classification problems in which the goal is to predict a categorical response. In the next video, we'll expand our scikit-learn toolbox by learning about a machine learning model for regression in which the goal is to predict a continuous response. We'll also learn how to read a data set into Pandas, a very popular library for data analysis and exploration, so that we can work with the data in scikit-learn. I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. What do you like about this series so far, and what could be better? What would you like to learn in the next few videos? And what questions do you have? I value your feedback, and I read every single comment. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you again soon.